Good morning. Hello. Uh, my name is Jerome Dolphin, and I'm a technical marketing engineer with the SD Access Business Unit. We are here to today to discuss SD Access and multi domain segmentation. And let me begin by saying that I used to think the Friday morning session was a curse. Uh, for some reason, I seem to catch it every time we come here. But I've come to discover that the audience that comes on a Friday morning is a fantastic audience. They're generally engaged and enthusiastic, so I enjoy this opportunity and I hope you feel the same. All right, there is a WebEx thing. I imagine people are reasonably familiar with this by now. I have put a diagram in the Teams room which we may be referring to, or we will be referring to throughout this presentation. My plan was to have the diagram on one screen and the presentation on the other, but that's not going to work given the width of the room. So if you log into the app, you can access the diagram. It's also in the PDF, and maybe I'll just point to it briefly when we get to that section so you can maybe take a snapshot it on your phone if you wish to. The agenda for today, introduction, hello, uh, this is a lab-based presentation, so I'm going to walk through the lab configuration that underpins the concepts we'll be introducing and demonstrating. And then we'll walk through a number of key multi-domain segmentation tools. It begins with transits, uh, which are fundamental to SD access. And then we'll move into some other topics, firewalls, endpoint analytics, Cisco Secure Endpoint, rapid threat containment. These are all words right now, but as we move through the presentation, hopefully they'll become more solidified in your minds as to what that actually represents. I am uh, getting a little bit out of my lane here as we move through this presentation. I spend most of my time in SD access, so when we get into stuff like Firepower or ACI, uh, I will be not having all of the answers. Uh, I can only go so far, so go easy on me if I can't give you an answer. Put it in the room and I'll try and dig it up later on. Okay. This is a POC, proof of concept, inspired presentation. Uh, in, when I began at Cisco in the SD Access role, the core deliverable of the role, which was five years ago, was proof of concept. So we'd go and meet with customers and partners and prove that SD Access could do something and you know, in order to give them a sense that, yes, this is possible. Uh, so as, we were, as I was traveling to various places, upsetting my wife and my dog, uh, it occurred to me that maybe I don't need to repeat these common themes over and over in a one-on-one -on -one basis, and maybe we capture some of them and share them in an, in an environment like this so that it's recorded and you all have a sense of common proof of concept questions that come up. My exotic accent is from the faraway lands of Australia. Uh, I live in Melbourne ordinarily, or just outside of Melbourne. Uh, and in Melbourne, there is a Cisco office. And in the Cisco office, uh, I have been very lucky to collect various pieces of network infrastructure over the last few years. Uh, I've built all of this by hand, put the racks in, the, the, I wasn't allowed to put the power in, but everything has been installed by me. Uh, over time, you collect different components from, uh, from various places, or sometimes we get some money to buy new things. So I put it, put it all together in an attempt to, for me to understand how the technology works, to test the technology, and then obviously to share some of the outcomes with uh, folks like yourselves. So why might you sit through this presentation? We are going to go wide, not deep. Uh, although I spend most time in SD Access, this is a wide discussion that branches security, data center, uh, route switch in SD-WAN, wireless, wired. Um, so it is a very bro broad uh, topic domain spanning most of the Cisco portfolio. Uh, we are going to learn through doing, so I'll introduce an idea. We'll then do it in the lab, and we'll see the outcome uh, as expected, obviously. If you have questions, please put your hand up or type it into the room, uh, and we will get to those. Why might you not want to stay? Well, there is an assumed level of knowledge here. Uh, I'm going to say things like EPG or ACI or AWS, and uh, we won't have time to introduce what those things are and build them from the ground up. Uh, 
the, you'll need to have a sense of what it is. Or alternatively, if, if something misses the mark and needs some homework, I've got reference material in each section. So you could go and download the PDF later, check the reference material, and if you're truly keen, potentially watch the presentation again to connect the dots. This is also not a deep dive, so there's no packet captures or debugs or CLI snips. It's really about showing functional outcomes and integrations. There's many ways to solve technical problems, as you may expect, and I'm going to tackle some of the sort of mainstream ways of solving technical problems today. But uh, if there's one thing I want you to take away from the discussion, this is really an illustration of the art of the possible as we move through this. So I may present a solution to a problem, but there's probably other solutions to the same problem I haven't presented. And so I hope this is, functions as a thought-provoking exercise where you may think, well, I can solve that. This guy showed me one way, that doesn't work, maybe there's another way. And obviously, you know, go and have those exploratory conversations with sales partners on communities. Uh, meet the experts, probably not so relevant today because it's the last day, but next year if you're at Cisco Live or you go to Vegas or something like that, um, then there is that meet the expert function where you can sit down with an engineer who specializes in a thing. Okay, into the lab. Uh, so I will introduce some concepts, then we will demonstrate it, and then we'll move on to the next section. Um, so in each, in some of the sections, there's some primers. I imagine most people are familiar with SD access, so I won't talk much about this. Uh, but just in case, software-defined access is a campus LAN networking solution to deliver visibility, segmentation, containment, automation, and assurance. So it is for wired and wireless endpoints that connect into your campus LAN. Uh, it is part of, as we'll see, it fits into the broader zero trust architecture of Cisco. Um, I'll explain that in a minute. DNA center is mandatory for SD access. You put business intent into DNA center, give me a virtual network, give me a segmentation outcome, give me an SSID. DNA Center runs that intent through configuration models that are created by people much smarter than me. And those models are pushed into the wired and wireless network infrastructure across tens, hundreds, or potentially thousands of devices. In DNA Center, when we create an SD access fabric, um, it forces you or requires you to, at minimum, provision a fabric border node. This is how packets get in and out of a campus LAN fabric to the outside world, to a, tra a traditional routing domain, like BGP or VLANs or <coughs> static routes. There is edge nodes, wired and wireless endpoints plug into edge nodes in an SD access fabric. And there is a control plane node, which is a host tracking database, keeping track of what is connected where within a given fabric site. Those are the mandatory components. We have optional components within SD Access. You don't have to use these on day one. You can roll them into your implementation as time elapses. <coughs> For the most part, um, although we say ISC is optional in 99.9% .9 of cases, Identity Services Engine is part of an SD Access fabric. There's some corner cases where you may not want to use it, like you don't need AAA or you don't need micro segmentation or you don't plan to do that immediately. But as we'll see in this presentation, ISE is critical to almost everything we're going to demonstrate. Fabric-enabled wireless is a wireless solution that is integrated into the fabric control plane, policy plane, and management plane. We'll see why that's important a little bit later on, but for now, um, the takeaway is that it is one unified fabric ac across the wired and wireless infrastructure. Extended nodes are layer two switches. Uh, generally, we don't encourage layer two, but sometimes it's a necessary evil, especially on some of the older switching infrastructure, like the industrial Ethernet 33 and 34, as an example, where they are not capable of participating in fabric, but they are necessary to survive in hostile environments. The latest hardened switches will uh, be able to implement the whole fabric architecture, like the 9200CX and the IE9300. So I suspect as time moves on, the uh, policy extended nodes will be less necessary. They'll be proper fabric nodes. 
Intermediate nodes are big layer three switches. They move packets between elements in the fabric. You can have zero or 10 or 100 intermediate nodes. It doesn't matter as long as uh, fabric devices can reach other fabric devices in an underlay network, in a routed network. <coughs> Excuse me. So zooming into the lab with that introduction, we have a DNA center and an ISE. They are integrated. There is three fabric sites uh, that we'll be using throughout the course of the demonstration. The left-hand site, the west site, we'll be bringing up during the presentation. Central and east are already established. We'll see that in the, in the DNA center in a moment. Uh, I don't bring these sites up because there's plenty of other Cisco Live presentations that do zero to functional for SD access. Uh, Simone and Ramses, for those that know them, had a good uh, bring up a fabric from scratch Cisco Live presentation that's been recorded a number of times. So these uh, central and east sites are already operational. There is an ACI implementation, so an on-prem Nexus 9000 based software defined data center fabric with a server inside of it. There is also a virtual data center, uh, AWS I selected in this case because that was easy enough for me to bring up with, um, with uh, the options available in, in the lab and the connectivity Cisco could provide. There is a giant aggregation switch, so it's just doing routing between elements. Ordinarily, you would have more than one, but for the sake of a simple discussion, I have a single routed aggregation switch. There is an SD-WAN implementation. It will connect west site to the aggregation switch. There is a Metro E uh, implementation, and by Metro E, I mean anything that is high speed, low latency, and has no MTU challenges. Um, so. Choose your, choose your poison there. There is a services block with various hosts or various servers instantiated, uh, which we'll be using throughout the lab. I won't bother introducing all these things right now. It'll become apparent what they do as we move through the demonstrations. There is a physical and a virtual uh, Cisco Secure Firewall, the FTD flavor. Uh, the physical one is on-prem and the virtual one uh, is in the AWS VPC. And there is an internet service with various internet things attached to it. So this will be the reference diagram uh, if someone wants to commit it to memory. I don't, I don't um, a lot of the technical stuff I introduce here, I'll talk you through as we move through the presentation. So please don't feel compelled to remember all the detail. But if you're the kind of person that wants to remember the detail, um, this is one of the slides that you'll, you'll probably be better served remembering. You'll notice there is hosts connected to each fabric site. I've got some BMS hosts, uh, some staff devices. One is connected over Fabric Wireless, the rest are wired. This book in the top right corner is my way of trying to say, this is a reference if you're going through this presentation in six months from now, if you're going through it. Please don't feel compelled to remember uh, anything that has the book symbol. It's more of an orientational content for someone that really wants to pick this apart in future. So I'm just sharing with you what is the routing topology underneath those devices we just looked at. Uh, the, the aggregation switch, the IP core, uh, has VRF light configured, so it's got a few VRFs, as you can see, corp, IoT, and servers. In global routing table are all of our services, DNA center, ICE, et cetera, et cetera. We have our three fabric sites. Virtual networks have been provisioned to those fabric sites already, regardless of whether they do or don't exist. In DNA center, when you provision a virtual network to a site, obviously it's just a database entry in DNA center. If there is switching infrastructure there, then DNA center will actually provision the VRFs. In the east side, there's back-to-back -back VRFs between the east side border nodes and the IP core switch. This, uh, in some other SD access discussions, would be called an IP-based transit. It's just back-to-back -back VRFs with routing. Central site just has global routing table reachability. That's because we'll be installing a transit here that doesn't require back-to-back -back VRFs. And, um, there is two elements to the SD-WAN cloud, as you'll see in the diagram. There is a hub that is backs into that aggregation router, and then there is an SD-WAN edge node at the west site. During the course of the discussion, we will bring up the west site SD-WAN edge node, which will cross-connect uh, 
SD access virtual networks to SD WAN VPNs. ACI has a single VRF with a single server. The physical firewall has a leg into each VRF. So the takeaway here is the firewall is doing inter-network routing. This will allow us to do some inter-network policy on the firewall. ACI, oh, sorry, ACI, AWS is reachable through this little cloud here. This cloud actually represents the Cisco corporate network, and it is full of security policy and complexity that was very hard to route around. So if you see one or two gremlins as we move through some of the AWS stuff, that's because I don't have a raw connection to it. I've got a connection through Cisco IT, and they have loads of security policy in that, um, which stops some, some things from working the way I would have liked. Next time, I hope to get a virtual data center connection directly into the lab so there's no intermediary there doing stuff. The firewall has a single routing table, the on-prem firewall. Again, the book, don't remember this, it's just a reference slide. But the, the takeaway is each VRF connects to a different zone on the firewall. It's actually a HA pair with port channels and all sorts of good stuff. Um, default route leaks from the firewall into each virtual network, and virtual networks advertise various subnets into the firewall. Another reference slide. Um, as you saw on the diagram, there is endpoints already connected into the fabric. There's some staff endpoints, CCTV and BMS. They are allocated to a virtual network, corporate or IoT, and they are assigned an SGT by default. We'll talk about what SGT and virtual network means a little bit later. Uh, again, just a reference slide that we can refer back to later if we need to. We're doing segmentation policy throughout this, this conversation. Don't remember this, it's just a reference. But what this is trying to say is within the campus land, within the SD access fabrics, we'll be doing some SGT to SGT segmentation. We'll allow some SGTs to talk to others, but not others. In the firewall, there will also be segmentation policy and it will be more advanced. It will be SGT to SGT, SGT to EPG, so SD access to data center, and SGT to AWS attributes. SGT to subnet, SGT to URL, like cisco.com. So the firewall is quite powerful and it can pull in all of these different policy objects from different domains and cross-reference them in policy. I'll show you what that looks like when we get to it. All right. So a very quick walkthrough so you just get a sense of what is going on here. Beg your pardon. All right. So in DNA Center, uh, which is obviously the controller for our SD access fabric, uh, we have some design hierarchy already set up. So you can see here, west site, central site, and then on the right hand side is the two, which is the east site. It shows a number instead of a name. In DNA Center design menu and network settings, we have uh, ISC set up for client authorization. Beg your pardon, I'll go back. We have identity services engine set up for client authorization, and we have some NTP service defined, just basic configuration that establishes a foundation for the network we'll be working on. There is a wireless SSID. The wireless endpoint is associated to that already. And there is some IP address pools. So these are just subnets that are provisioned to the SD access fabric site. Um, you don't really need to remember these subnets. The thing that's going to matter throughout this conversation is group tags. We'll be using group tags to apply policy. IP ranges are just a medium for connectivity. Go ahead, sir. <coughs> what version am I using? This is DNA Center 2.3.3 and ICE 3.1, I think. It's not the absolute latest DNA Center, um, but it was the one that could do all the features I needed during recording. All right, uh, subnets are present, endpoints connect into them. They're called host pools or any cast gateways. But um, as far as the policy is concerned, which is the focus of this, dis this discussion, the group based policy objects will be more important. There is network infrastructure already discovered in DNA Center. So we've got some switches, wireless LAN controller, APs. All of the components are here except for the West Fabric site, which we'll be bringing up. So they are not yet in inventory. If we have a look at the SD access application, the three fabric sites are created. Uh, the east site has two border nodes and control plane nodes, two edge nodes, fabric AP and a wireless LAN controller. 
the central site is a fabric in a box, so it is a border control plane, edge node, and wireless land controller in a Catalyst 9300 in this case. And the west site currently has nothing in it because we'll be bringing that up uh, in the next section of this discussion. We'll be talking about group-based policy a little bit later, but in a different section of DNA Center, in a different menu, uh, we are able to create group tags which are assigned to endpoints to represent their role in the network. And we are able to build into a group tag policy, group-based policy, or SGT-based policy. At this point in time, anything is permitted to anything. So this matrix here on screen represents sources and destinations in the ST Access fabric, and the white cells represent a default policy. In the top right there, it says default permit IP. So at this point, we have full open connectivity. And as we move through the discussion, we'll start to lock this down. In Identity Services Engine, there is some policy sets, or some authorization policies already defined. These are pretty straightforward. Um, what is happening here is endpoints, as, they're, as they authenticate and authorize into the network, are assigned different SGTs based on either attributes or credentials. So they're assigned into a particular virtual network and they're assigned an SGT. Um, at this point, it is CCTV, SGT to CCTV, BMS to BMS, employee to staff endpoints. We'll start to manipulate this as we move through the presentation, but for now it's reasonably straightforward. Yes, sir, go ahead. Does it mean we have to run 802.1x to achieve what, you're showing? what I'm showing? Uh, there's, there'll be varying means of assigning endpoints into virtual networks and assigning SGTs. 802.1x is one mechanism. You will also, um, we'll show some MAC auth bypass outcomes a little bit later in the discussion. Or if you're not ready to go to the 802.1x MAB journey yet, ports can always be statically assigned. So just you know, switch port access X, but you do it through the DNA center user interface. So there's a few ways to attack this thing. You don't, everything I'm going to show you today is a journey, by the way. So you don't, um, please don't think of SD access as extremely complex or not at all. Once we establish a framework by putting in the foundation for SD access, it may take months or years for an organization to transition through this journey. I'm just trying to lay out a roadmap of how we go from zero to full segmentation. Okay. In the TrustSec dashboard, uh, I apologize for the zoom here, but what I'm trying to show you is that an SGT is assigned to each endpoint. So there's four BMSs, uh, two employees, and one CCTV. There's two SGTs that are not assigned yet. This is because we have not yet brought up the West Fabric site, which we'll be doing in the next section. All right. All right. Okay. So we'll begin with transits and end-to-end -end segmentation. As I said, each section begins with some reference material. These are hyperlinks, so if you download the PDF later and click the hyperlink, it will take you to this reference material. A lot of it's ciscolive.com. Uh, some of my colleagues run some great uh, presentations that zoom in on various topics we're talking about. And there is obviously the SD Access CVD. All right, some primer material before we get into segmentation. SD Access implements virtual networks, layer two and layer three. They are isolated, layer three virtual networks are isolated routing tables. When a packet goes into one layer three virtual network, it can't jump to another unless you implement a policy saying it can jump to another layer three virtual network. That policy is either routing out or back in, or um, as, we'll, as you'll see in the next few months, an extranet policy. Uh, I, covered that in a different presentation. It's not quite out yet, but we're very close to interconnecting VRS through policy. Layer two virtual networks are isolated switching tables. We won't be using that in this discussion, but just for context, there is layer two virtual networks as well. For anyone that has worked with VRF Lite or MPLS, 
layer three virtual networks are VRF. So I even catch myself using VRF and layer three virtual network language interchangeably sometimes. Okay, so that's the first primer. The second primer is uh, group-based policy and security group tags. So very quickly, when endpoints connect into the network, into an ST access fabric, you can assign an SGT to those endpoints dynamically through ISC, statically on a port, or statically on a VLAN, or statically on an SSID. You don't have to use SGTs. Uh, most people in reality will probably start with an SD access fabric and over their journey post implementation, they'll start to roll in SGTs as they feel comfortable with understanding what is on the network and how these things behave. All endpoints, wired or wireless in an SD access fabric, receive an SGT when you get to that point in the journey. That SGT represents the source or the role of the endpoint in the network. So in this case, uh, we've got SGT5 assigned to this camera. As packets traverse the network, the source SGT is attached. It moves with the data as it, as it routes and switches through the network. And at egress, we know both the source SGT and the destination SGT, which allows us, to, or the switching infrastructure, to consult the group-based policy matrix. We saw that before. At this point, it has nothing in it, and it's permit everything. But as we start to manipulate this, we'll see some of these policies change. So in this hypothetical example, we see cameras are allowed to talk to lighting devices. So this packet is routed to the lighting device and, and the, the transaction begins. If the packet was going to HVAC in this hypothetical scenario, it would be denied by the group-based policy matrix. Now what I've shown you here is two devices, wired devices, on different SD access edge nodes. But what I have shown, the principles of what I've shown applies regardless of whether the, the devices are wired or wireless, regardless of whether they're on the same AP or different APs or the same SSID or different SSIDs. Um, the segmentation objects work precisely the same, which is why I said before unification of the wired and wireless data and policy planes is important. It is the same policy regardless of whether it's a wired or wireless endpoint within the same device or across devices. So we've got virtual networks and SGTs within fabric sites. If we need, if you are doing multi-site, which obviously this diagram is, we have three fabric sites, typically you would want to carry those, those segmented routing tables, those layer three virtual networks, and the SGTs between sites. So you get the same segmentation outcomes across all of your fabric sites. There's three ways to interconnect fabric sites. The first is what we call IP-based transit. It is really back-to-back -back VRFs. On the border node, you connect that in DNA Center UI to an IP-based transit. It will configure an IP interface in a different VLAN per SD access layer three virtual network. When we get extranet policy later, that will change things a little bit. But extranet policy, the leaking of connectivity between VRFs actually undoes segmentation. So even if we had extranet policy and we're very close, it's not relevant to this discussion. In an IP-based transit, the middle bit there, the IP cloud, is not automated by DNA Center. It is something that is routing that is not the responsibility of SD access. It is your job, the partner's job, the customer's job, to make that in-between bit work. In the case of end-to-end multi-domain segmentation, they probably need to make it VRF aware and capable of transporting SGTs between locations. There's many ways you can attack that beast, uh, but it's outside of the SD access discussion because it is really any networking infrastructure that you can conceive of and any configuration you can conceive of. There is SD access transit. This is automated by DNA Center. We'll see this in a moment. And you can, to some degree, you can think of SD access transit as an SD access fabric site that interconnects SD access fabric sites. So it's, it is almost hierarchical SD access. What I mean is each fabric site has border nodes, edge nodes, and control plane nodes. And then the transit has its own dedicated control plane nodes. That's the TC on the diagram, which is really just another LISP database that facilitates connectivity between SD access fabric sites. 
the SD Access Transit uses all the same architecture that the SD Access Fabric site uses. What this means is layer three virtual networks and SGTs are natively preserved throughout an SD Access Transit because it's, it's all the same technology, just broken up into uh, hierarchical blocks so it scales. <clears throat> the final flavor of transit is an SD-WAN transit. And this is referring specifically to the Cisco SD-WAN architecture. Um, there is, uh, in the reference section of this, of this uh, discussion, there is two product deployment guides linked. One PDG is for SD-WAN independent domains, and the other is for SD-WAN integrated domains. And you'll see this in the diagram here. Independent domains is using Cisco SD-WAN backed onto Cisco SD Access, but the two domains are unaware of each other. They are configured as ships in the night. However, SD-WAN can preserve those SD Access layer three virtual networks in SD-WAN VPNs, and it can carry SGTs through the SD-WAN fabric. So you could think of it as IP-based transit, but with all of the functionality you need to get that end-to-end -end macro and micro segmentation. That's independent domains. Integrated domains is where an SD-WAN edge node is both participating in the SD-WAN fabric and also participating in the SD-Access fabric concurrently. So you can see there the little shield thing means SD-WAN and the BN and CP means SD-Access. Now I draw your attention to the comments directly above these images, more flexible, less automated, less flexible, more automated. This is an important point to note. When you go to integrated domains, the amount of configuration flexibility, because it is fully automated, is reduced. Or if you do independent domains, you have to do more work, but then the configuration options are really uh, as far as the portfolio, the SD-WAN portfolio can accommodate. Um, so there is, this is an important strategic decision, and um, our, our current sort of messaging to the world is, if you're not sure, use independent domains, because what happens is, you start the deployment, time elapses, and six months later, someone says, what about IPv6 multicast, or something that the integrated domains can't do? And at that point, you have to go back and unpick it and rebuild it. Um, so read the PDGs at the start. It outlays what these two solutions can and can't do, and pick the right one to solve your specific problems. If you're unsure, lean towards independent domains. Okay, so with that, um, Preservation of segmentation objects is crucial if we're doing end-to-end -end segmentation, obviously. That means, um, as we saw in the walkthrough before, to apply a policy, we need source SGT and destination SGT to be known at the policy enforcement point, so the egress switch in this operating model. That means we need to preserve SGT as packets move throughout the network. There's two ways we can do that. One is in the data plane by sticking the SGT on the wire. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And the second is to do it in a control plane through SXP. Now, SXP is not bad or wrong. It is a, it is a useful technology. But this is a short discussion about best practice SD access configurations. So the general sort of messaging I put out in a short discussion is control plane SGT distribution does not necessarily scale well. If you have hundreds of thousands of IP addresses and, and SGTs in your network, you don't want to peer SXP to a 9300 switch, which doesn't have the memory to deal with that. So as a general rule, we try to say, stay away from SXP. If you need to use it, do your research or talk to someone that understands it well. This presentation, we focused on moving SGTs in the data plane. Okay, four ways we move SGTs in the data plane. One is in Ethernet. You can see it is between the Ethernet header and the IP header here. This means that every hop that forwards an SGT above the Ethernet header or between Ethernet and IP, every hop needs to honor that SGT or at least not take it out or drop it as a corruption. 
Now, if you were to send an SGT and Ethernet into a third-party network infrastructure, there's no guarantees it will, it will accept that and forward it. It might just drop a packet or it might strip the SGT. I've linked a matrix here of Cisco platforms that do forward SGTs. For the most part, Cat9K switching is perfectly fine. Some of the older switching infra can't do it, and some of the service provider switching infra can't do it. This is why, for the most part, we don't send SGTs in Ethernet unless we own every device in the forwarding path. And that leads us into SGT tunneling. You can put SGTs in GRE. This means that they are above the IP header in the protocol stack, and all of the things in the middle don't care what is inside a GRE header. They just forward it. They make their switching and routing decision. You could put it in VXLAN, which is exactly what SD Access uses. In this case, the SGT is tunneled in the VXLAN GPO header, which you can see there as a four. Immediately below this, by the way, uh, which I have not marked, but just as a, as a side note, is the virtual network ID. This is the layer two or the layer three virtual network ID. So VXLAN GPO tunnels both virtual networks and SGTs inside of this header. All the stuff in the middle, your service provider that routes between fabric sites, for example, when you have SD Access Transit, doesn't care what's in VXLAN GPO because it doesn't have to process it. You can also send SGTs in IPsec. There is an SGT in this packet, but obviously you can't see it because it's tunneled inside of that, um, that encryption there. SD-WAN uses IPsec to move stuff between places, including SGTs. OK, so let's start the demonstration. We will use SD Access Transit to tunnel virtual networks and SGTs between two sites, and we'll use SD-WAN Transit to tunnel virtual networks and SGTs between two other sites. Uh, I'll go back for a second. I've covered some other variations of this previously. These are hyperlinks. So for anyone that's interested in SXP, that was covered in a previous presentation. Uh, for anyone that's interested in, in uh, SGT inside of GRE. In this case, it was DMVPN. That's linked inside of another uh, presentation there. But in this presentation, we're using VXLAN and SD-WAN. How does it work? SGTs are assigned at the edge on a AP or on a switch port. They're tunneled within fabric sites, along with the virtual network ID inside of VXLAN GPO, which we just saw. In the case of the east to central site, V, uh, SGTs and virtual networks will be tunneled again inside of VXLAN GPO using the SD Access Transit function. They will be sent to the SD WAN edge node or the hub node that the right hand SD WAN node there is in independent domains mode. It has VRFs and those VRFs appearing to IP core. It will take SGTs from Ethernet and it will stick them into the SD-WAN encapsulation. So we send SGTs and Ethernet towards the top right SD-WAN node. We will capture the bottom SD-WAN node, which will be the edge node for west site. It, in turn, will be used to seed uh, a switch. That, and these devices will be brought online to establish an SD-Axis fabric site. Now, I didn't really want to do this bring up of the edge switch and the AP as part of this discussion. But the challenge is that in an SD-WAN co-located domain, you can't have an SD-WAN node without the transit immediately attached. As you'll see, the second we bring up an, uh, an integrated domain's edge node, the transit is present. It's natively, it's inherent to the functionality. So I'll bring up the whole West site as part of the discussion. All right, demo. Okay, so what we have here uh, in the lab, as I mentioned, all of these devices are uh, virtual machines. So they're real, the, the, the employee devices, the BMS and the CCTV devices, these are all real machines with IP address and MAC address. They're all in VMware. So I just grabbed the console of a few of these machines as we move through the discussion, just to show connectivity outcomes to prove that something doesn't exist or does exist or has been taken away. Um, so it's just a little script that pings around the network. So we can see here, um, top left is East Staff. You can see it in the title bar there. You can cross-reference that name to the diagram. And you can also see it as the host name of the device, East Staff. 
Here we have the, one of the East BMS devices, and it's also on the host name of the device. So hopefully the title bar or the host name gives you a sense of where this fits into the network when you cross-reference it with the diagram. Right, so East staff. If we just look through this, I'll explain this outcome once, and then um, we, we don't need to talk about it anymore. East staff can reach its default gateway, so it's connected into the switching infra. It can't reach central or west because the transits are not established yet. It can reach East BMS, which is in a different virtual network, because packets go out the corporate virtual network through the firewall and back into the IoT virtual network. It cannot reach central and west again because the transits are not operational. It can reach our ACI host, our AWS host, and our internet address. Um, and as we'll see as we move through this discussion, these connectivity outcomes will change based on policy and routing decisions that we make. All right, so the first thing we'll do is build the SD access transit between east site and central site. This, uh, I almost feel a little bit guilty because this is very easy to do. Um, I have a transit already established. I probably should have built it, but it's, it's already in the, the recording. To create a transit, you click Create Transits. You choose the devices that participate as transit control planes and press Submit. So it is two or three clicks. There's nothing exciting. You haven't missed anything by having this pre-constructed. But I have an SD access transit pre-built. Uh, we go ahead and attach this transit to the east site border nodes. So add transit, choose the transit. In this case, we're going to share internet access. What this means is east side border node will advertise the presence of internet access into the SD access transit. Other transit connected sites may choose to use east site as an egress point towards the internet. So we add the transit to both border nodes. I'll fast forward because it's precisely the same on the second border node. Add transit, share internet, and submit. And that's it. East side is connected to SD access transit. Same thing on west side. Go to the border node, oh, sorry, central site, I beg your pardon. Go to the border node, configure, attach transit, add, submit. We don't share internet here because it has no internet access. And that's it. SD access transit is established, <coughs> excuse me, between two fabric sites. And with that, when we rerun our script, what we see is east site staff device can now contact central site uh, central site CCTV in IOTVN and central site uh, BMS in wherever it is. So, sorry, central site CCTV and central site staff are both reachable now. So we know that the SD access transit is up and the VN routing is established. Okay. Next, the SD WAN transit to connect east to west. Now, um, I did go a little bit too far here. I think it's slightly off topic, so I'll power through this with the fast forward button and sort of commentate. DNA Center is integrated with vManage, so we can share information between these systems. This is just IP addresses and passwords. This is the vManage UI. This is the controller for the SD-WAN fabric. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, uh, welcome. Here it is. We're not going to go into vManage in any great detail. vManage is managing two devices. One, two 8300s. One is the hub device. The other will be the co-located co or co-located domains border node and SD-WAN edge node. With that integration established, inside of vManage, we go to integration management and we choose to share the 8300 edge node at west site with DNA Center. When we execute this sharing back in DNA Center, what we'll find is that this device has appeared in inventory and is ready to be managed within DNA Center. So we go to unassigned devices, and now we have an 8300 here. We assign 8300 to a location. It will be going to the, uh, to the west site, and I'll just put it on level one here. Now, this next part is a little off topic, so excuse me, but I will use this 8300 to capture a factory default 9300 switch at the west site. This is using LAN automation, which is, uh, for those that don't know, is a technology inside of DNA Center that captures factory default switches and puts a basic routing configuration on them. That means these factory default switches are ready to participate in SD-Access Fabric later. Uh, so 
Land automation is not really the theme of the discussion here, but I had no choice but to do this because the 8300 wasn't yet operational in Fabric. Um, we need to bring it up as part of the discussion. Put in some preliminary data for land automation to run. We just say find factory default devices in this location using this IP range with, this, with these passwords. Um, so we start land automation. It runs for a while. This is the console of the factory default switch at West site. As you can see, it is continually searching for an IP address, which is how fundamentally how LAN automation works. Factory default devices search for an IP address. When they find one, this thing called plug and play agent fires inside of the device, and it searches for, uh, it searches for a DNA center or a plug and play cloud. It searches for a place where it can find a preliminary configuration. So you'll see here, um, this is at 35 speed, by the way, land, um, land automation and plug and play don't run um, in a space of three seconds ordinarily. But you can see here are PNP messages, so we know plug and play is fired. You can see some ISIS and BFD messages, which means land automation has captured this device and pushed in a preliminary routing configuration. And we'll just power through the land automation stuff. The rest is just administration. We finish land automation. Eventually, the device shows up in DNA center inventory there. It is currently just running ISIS and has a loopback address. We now need to provision each of these devices to a location. We'll provision them to west site. Provision in DNA center means take the design menu, so the ICE, PSN, and the uh, NTP servers, and put them into the provisioned devices. And it also means DNA Center is now in charge of these devices. They are ready and primed to be part of the SD Access fabric. So if we go back to our west site here, we can see that these devices are now present and ready to accept a fabric role. The 8300 edge node will be a border and a control plane. Now see here, the transit is already attached. I can't not attach the transit. It's on the bottom of the screen there because it has a leg into both domains. It cannot not bridge between SD-WAN and SD-ACCESS. So we make it a border and a control plane. And on the edge node, we make it an edge node. And because it's a small site, it will also function as an embedded wireless LAN controller. It will manage the fabric SSIDs for this location. Submit and deploy and those devices come up in their SD access roles. Okay, now you don't see the wireless access point here. Um, it needs to boot, find its wireless LAN controller, download a configuration, be discovered by DNA Center. It comes up in a few minutes, but it's off screen. Um, so you'll have to take my word for it, I suppose. Okay. All right, so west site is operational. It is connected to a transit. The endpoints were already patched into that edge switch. So by virtue of provisioning the edge switch, it now has 802.1x and MAB port control. And the ICE policy is already present. We had that at the start. We use the same VLAN IDs across all sites. So the same ICE policy should be deployed to this new site. And as a consequence, when we run our script now, everything is reachable. Uh, including, as we can see, the West Site CCTV and the West Site staff. Same from BMS. The BMS device at East Site has full reachability to everything. Okay. So all virtual networks established and virtual network preservation between East, West, and Central is operational. Looking in TrustSec dashboard, we can now see that nine SGTs are assigned and that corresponds to the nine endpoints on the diagram. Um, this is hopefully reasonably intuitive, CCTV to CCTV, BMS to BMS, and so on. Okay. Now, in the policy we introduced in the first section, it was our intention to not have BMS and CCTV, even though they exist in the same network, it was our intention to not have these things communicate with each other. Even though they are in the same IP range, in the same VLAN, they should not uh, correspond. There's plenty of good reasons for that. 
Um, if anyone's familiar with all of the stories of self-spreading worms and hacks, um, we don't want things to be able to talk to things if it's an unnecessary transaction. Um, for anyone that's heard of uh, Mirai, Botnet, this is where uh, IoT devices were compromised and then they became a launching pad to uh, com compromise other IoT devices. Um, it's an interesting story. Then this thing called Brickabot came along. Some internet vigilante invented Brickabot to break compromised devices before they were compromised. So Brickabot would actually search for IoT devices and destroy them so that Mirai couldn't compromise them, um, which I'm not sure which is more productive. But um, there's plenty of examples of worms moving through the network and destroying things. There was another good one called NotPetya, if people are familiar with that. But NotPetya would spread between Windows machines and all it would do is destroy it. It would just encrypt the drive and there's no way to undo it, which means the machine is essentially uh, ruined. There's a, uh, I won't say the name, but there's a, there's a, there's a popular uh, story out there about a shipping company that was almost destroyed by NotPetya, a global shipping company. They had one hard drive on a domain controller that was fortunately preserved because the domain controller was offline at the time the worm tore through their network. So we don't want things talking to things unnecessarily because this is exactly how when something goes sideways, it can go sideways very quickly. In this example, BMS does not need to talk to SGT, so we will put this micro-segmentation into the switching and wireless infrastructure. Through the group-based policy UI, you click on the cell, you say deny, and that policy is pushed into the network building that group-based policy table we saw before. So on egress, if we have the source and the destination SGT, we can download the corresponding cell and block this traffic from flowing. So as we see here, I've changed BMS to, SGT pol uh, BMS to CCTV policy. We rerun the script, and you'll see now that BMS can no longer reach central CCTV and west CCTV. So this tells us that SGTs are being transported between fabric sites because we need the source SGT at the destination to implement policy. So we've got SGT over VXLAN and we've got SGT over SD-WAN transit. Okay. All right, that was a reasonably complex demo. That's the longest one now that we've established the groundwork. Uh, we can zoom into specifics. Okay, keep going. All right. I will do some more advanced segmentation. So this has been SGT segmentation in the switching infra in the fabric sites. We'll now grab some of these segmentation objects and we'll put them into the firewall infrastructure. Reference material you can go through later if you're inclined. Um, there is no theory component to this, uh, this section. The demonstration will be reasonably self-explanatory. What we'll do is grab ACI segmentation objects, AWS segmentation objects, and campus LAN segmentation objects, SGTs, EPGs, and um, AWS server names. And we will use these objects to build inter-domain segmentation policy. How does it work? We have our on-prem firewall managed by Cisco Secure Firewall. We send SGTs to the on-prem firewall. We do not send SGTs to ACI. There is no need because ACI doesn't honor or process SGTs. We do not send SGTs to the internet because they mean nothing in the internet. And we do not send them to the Cisco corporate network to reach AWS because the Cisco corporate network will just drop them. I was hoping uh, to have an SD-WAN edge node in the AWS cloud and hook AWS directly into the SD-WAN solution. Unfortunately, um, the, the security restrictions in place didn't allow that. But next time, if I get a bit more runway, I'll try an SD-WAN right into AWS. That way we might be able to get some SGTs closer to the AWS domain through uh, the SD-WAN solution. But not this time, unfortunately. OK, so with all of these objects, how do we get them all together and apply inter-object policy? There is an app in APIC, which is the ACI controller. It will feed EPGs, which are the ACI group objects, into Firewall Management Center. We've got CSDAC, which will collect objects from public and private clouds 
AWS, Google, Azure, VMware, other things that's in the AWS, uh, in the CS DAC guide. But it collects objects from public and private clouds and publishes them into the firewall. And then there is a firewall ICE integration to learn SGTs from the campus land, which have been defined in DNA Center and pushed over to ICE and distributed to the network infrastructure. Firewall Management Center puts all of these objects together and distributes policy into the virtual and physical firewall. Okay, so as we said before, East Staff has connectivity to everything, including AWS and, uh, and ACI, as does East BMS, as does CCTV. So apart from the micro-segmentation policy we put in before, BMS to SGT, there is full inter-domain connectivity. That's not what the uh, policy we showed at the start of this presentation called for. We actually, we actually said at the start of the presentation, we want CCTV to only communicate with the on-prem server, and we want BMS to only communicate with the AWS off-prem virtual server. So we need inter-domain, inter-object policy, which we'll build now. Uh, in firewall, this is firewall, uh, this is Cisco Secure Firewall Management Center. It is the management UI for the firewalling infrastructure. Um, it is integrated with ISE, so we're learning SGTs and IPSGT pairs from ISE. Um, inside of ISE, we can see that um, it thinks Firewall Management Center is integrated. It's, it's enabled as a PX Grid client. And now we can build some policies. So what's going to happen here is um, I have three firewalls, one on-prem, uh, FTD, one virtualized uh, FTDV, and the third firewall is not relevant to this discussion. It's just an offline firewall for something else. So we'll build some policy. Uh, the first policy we're going to build is a stateful inter-SGT policy. So what we're saying is employees should be able to talk to BMS and CCTV SGTs, which makes sense, employees manage devices. But the inverse should not be true. Devices should not be able to contact employees. So we build a policy and we reference, instead of IP subnets, group tags. The reason we use group tags instead of subnets is because subnets are a poor proxy for the identity or the role of a thing. It's much easier to use a tag. And what you can already see here is by calling employees tag, we're actually hiding behind that numerous IP addresses and numerous IP ranges. Um, this lab is small, but if you've got thousands of hosts and thousands of ranges, it's far easier to deal with tags that represent what the thing is rather than a subnet which may or may not actually represent what the thing is. All right, so but then we will then block the reverse transaction. Employees can manage devices, devices can't contact employees. The reason we do this in a firewall is because it is stateful in nature. Um, and there's plenty of other reasons to use a firewall as well, obviously. There's application inspection and lots of other clever security logic in a firewall. So sometimes inter-SGT policy is appropriate in the switching infrastructure. Sometimes if you need more advanced inter-SGT policy, it's better to force it to route through a firewall so we can have statefulness or guaranteed logging or application inspection or IPS or other things that firewalls do. So we'll deploy this policy and what we'll see, um, I, won't I won't make you watch the deploy here. What we'll see now is CCTV cannot talk to staff devices any longer because we've blocked CCTV to employee and we'll see the same in BMS. We'll see BMS cannot talk to staff devices any longer, but excuse me, what we'll see is staff devices can still contact uh, CCTV and BMS. So we have a stateful, directionally aware inter-SGT policy by virtue of using a firewall instead of uh, group-based policy. Okay. Uh, this is the UI for the, APIC con uh, for the software defined data center controller. It's called APIC. Uh, inside of APIC, there is a tenant called servers and there is an EPG called servers. EPG you could loosely think of as APIC's equivalent of SGT. It's a tag that represents the role of the thing in the data center domain. So in this case, I have a server behind EPG servers in APIC. And 
Also inside of APIC, I've installed what is called FMC uh, Endpoint Update. This is an app you can grab from cisco.com. Um, within the FMC Endpoint Update, we point it towards our firepower, uh, sorry, our firewall management center. And we're saying load all EPGs from the server's tenant in the data center domain into the firewalling infrastructure. The final piece of the puzzle is CSDAC, Dynamic Attributes Connector. As I said before, it collects attributes from public and private clouds and pushes those attributes into the firewalling infrastructure. In this case, CSDAC is integrated with AWS. It's downloading, um, it's downloading attributes from AWS. I should have been more creative here. Um, I've just matched the server name. I probably should have matched the AWS equivalent of SGT. I should have matched security group in AWS that way. We could have had a few things behind this. Um, but hopefully, this gives you a sense of what's possible, even if I haven't used the most uh, illustrative object here. So CSDAC is pulling attributes out of AWS, and it is loading them also into the firewall management center. So with all of that information, this allows us to build rules that refer to SGTs or EPGs or AWS attributes or other software, uh, other public or private cloud attributes um, courtesy of CSDAC. So we are going to block some traffic based on these attributes. What I've done here is said BMS should only talk to AWS. It should not talk to our on-prem server. So we're going to block BMS to the ACI servers EPG. Now, this is a network object inside the UI, but I didn't create it. The endpoint update app running in APIC creates this network object and publishes it with ACI addresses. All right, so we have a policy here saying that BMS server one should not be able to talk to uh, APIC servers EPG. We deploy that into the network infrastructure. In the virtual firewall, we'll deploy a separate policy. What we're going to say in the virtual firewall is that we should not allow CCTV SGT to speak to the AWS attribute servers too. And we'll block that as well and deploy it. What this means is we have now built an SGT to SGT policy, SGT to EPG, and SGT to AWS data center attributes into the, uh, the Cisco Secure Firewalling Infrastructure. This here is a packet walk proving some of the technical detail of how uh, the, the firewalling infrastructure matches SGTs, and uh, it's not relevant to the outcome, so I'll just skip through it to save us a little bit of time. Um, you may have noticed that SGTs are not being sent in the animation before. They are not being sent through the Cisco corporate network into the AWS cloud. So how does the virtual firewall in AWS know the source SGT? It is learning this over a control plane connection with Firewall Management Center. Firewall Management Center, as you may have seen in the diagram, is in turn learning this information from ISE. So I said before, we generally try to put SGTs into the data plane because it scales better. That is potentially less true with firewalling infrastructure because the firewalling infrastructure has more capacity for storing information. That is the purpose of a firewall, to track open cons, to log things, to drop packets. So loading IP SGT pairs into, into a firewall is probably OK. There is scaling limits um, in the firewall documentation. I can't remember what they are offhand, but they're reasonably generous. All right. So what we see here still is staff has access to everything. Um, this is proving that the servers aren't offline. They're still available and operational. But what we see also is BMS can no longer contact the server behind the server's EPG and ACI, the third last line here. So we've got SGT to EPG policy translated through the Firepower. Uh, sorry, Firepower was the old name of the firewall. I keep, I keep pulling it out when I speak. Translated through the Cisco Secure Firewall. And we'll see from the CCTV device the same outcome, but it, its connectivity has been cut off to 
the AWS server because we have SGT to AWS attribute policy inside of the virtual firewall. So you can see here that the AWS server becomes unreachable for the CCTV device. Okay. That was a fair bit. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm trying to give you ideas rather than explore all of this in gory detail. We'd be here for a day if we were going into the specifics. Go ahead, sir. Very good. So the question is, um, all this information, IP, SGT, IP, EPG, AWS, IP, all this information is streaming into Firewall Management Center and then being pushed out to the firewalling infrastructure. I, I don't purport to be a firewall expert. As a, it's, we're getting into shaky territory for me. I would assume that's absolutely right. Um, and I think for the SGTs, that's probably true. I think we have the, maybe the expert in the room, but yes. 99% likely you're right there, and as a consequence, FMC becomes crucial. Yeah, fair call. All right, two more sections to go. Uh, this section plans to show you how we can assess endpoints on the network, make an assertion as to what they are, and then assign them to a network over time as they transact we assign a trust score to those endpoints, and then we can dial up or dial down access. Uh, reference material, there's lots of research, uh, much like every section we're presenting here, there's lots of research you could do to learn all the specifics that are about to unfold. Um, but if I was to simplify it, I try to position uh, SD access, and I think Cisco is also starting to position it this way, as a foundation for the zero trust for the workplace architecture. Um, there is three components to zero trust architecture in the Cisco model, workforce, workplace, workload. Workplace is campus land, SD access falls under that umbrella. The three major pillars of the zero trust architecture and uh, our visibility, what is on the network, is it what we think it is, and is it behaving appropriately? For managed devices, this is not so hard. Managed devices are part of uh, maybe an Active Directory domain, they have certificates and posture agents and management, management um, applications on them. So visibility of managed devices is maybe less challenging, but visibility of IoT devices where you can't peer inside the operating system, they're just an IP address and a MAC address from the perspective of the network is more complicated. And what we're about to show you is important for visibility of unmanaged devices. Once we know what is on the network, we segment it to the minimum necessary level of access. Spoke before about brick bot and Mirai and not Petya. Things should not be able to talk to things if they don't need to talk. I've worked in, um, in a number of networks in partner and customer land for many years, and uh, we've been very fortunate that nothing's gone wrong in the time I've worked in those spaces, but like not Petya or Mirai, uh, it can rip through the network in, in a matter of minutes or hours. So all we need is a good zero day and, and things will get very ugly very quickly. So segmenting things into minimum level of access is a good step to take now in case something like that happens later. Obviously there's also uh, malicious actors who may use east-west connectivity to move through some sort of sequence of um, attack steps. What is in the network? Assign minimum access regularly confirm that that is the minimum access appropriate for that endpoint, and if the endpoint puts a toe out of line, contain it. I like to think of containment as a segmentation dial. We turn up segmentation to maximum, an endpoint is banned from the network, but as we'll see uh, with the trust scoring in a moment, you can also segment a little bit or, or more or less. It's really up to you. We provide the metrics, and then what action you take on that is entirely up to you. There's a lot happening here. As I said, there's, there's plenty of reference material to be done. But in short, DNA Center has the SD Access application we've been working in. It also hosts, if you have DNA Center, you have Endpoint Analytics. So it hosts the Endpoint Analytics application. It's a different menu item you'll see in a moment. Within Endpoint Analytics is also Trust Analytics. We'll be talking about both. 
Just a side note, E, A, and T, A don't require SD access. They play nicely together, but you can have DNA Center and Endpoint Analytics without SD access, uh, so just something to bear in mind. Sometimes it's better to get, a, to get a feel for what's on your network before you attempt to move to a fabric segmentation technology. Endpoint Analytics consumes telemetry from the network infrastructure and makes an assertion as to what a device is. I'll show you what this means in a moment. And this becomes particularly important for unmanageable devices like black box IoT things where they're just connected and you have no sense of who wrote the operating system, is it patched, is it vulnerable, is it compromised. Uh, the Mirai botnet would compromise IoT devices and then use it as a launching pad to compromise other IoT devices. But interestingly, those devices continue to function. So even though they appear to be working, they're actually doing bad things under the hood, which means we need visibility of what things, how things are transacting on the network. We also see here, push from DNA Center is two things. One is profile labels. Profile labels come out of endpoint analytics and they tell, they tell ISC what endpoint analytics thinks a device is. I'll show you in a moment. Um, we'll turn it into something tangible. It also pushes a trust score into ISC. So these labels and trust scores can be referenced inside of ICE policy to put things into networks and then segment them to varying degrees based on um, the assertions we make. I'll show you in a second. This is a reference slide. Uh, please don't remember it. What I'm trying to articulate here is that endpoint analytics and trust analytics do a lot of stuff, far more than we can cover in a few minutes. Um, but those reference presentations I, I showed at the start unpack this uh, in more detail. We'll be focusing on the top line and the bottom three lines. We'll profile things and then we'll derive a trust score based on port scan, uh, credential scan and uh, reputational IP. All right. So the demo. I connect a few real things into the lab. Uh, the challenge with the lab is it doesn't have hundreds of real endpoints. I've got one or two real endpoints, so we'll plug those in and we'll profile them um, into functions and assign them access to the network. We'll then use trust analytics to assign a trust score to devices and we'll configure ICE to respond to varying kinds of trust scores. ICE will quarantine something that has an ultra low trust score or um, I'll also show how you can manually quarantine a thing if you're not comfortable with automated quarantine. Uh, we, I did explore a different visibility tool previously uh, that was Cisco Secure Network Analytics, so there's a reference there if you want to explore that version of it. Okay, so how does it all fit together? Endpoints are plugged into the switch. As I said, I attach two real endpoints, an Apple TV, that's the TV looking screen, and a Meraki camera. Um, so these are real things that can be profiled based on real behavior as opposed to virtual machines. They're authenticated and authorized into the network. Their traffic is spanned to a traffic telemetry appliance, which looks at the packets coming in and out of these devices, generates telemetry about them, application, um, source, destination, uh, source, destination, IP, and so on and feeds that telemetry into DNA Center, which is consumed by Endpoint Analytics. DNA Center is also consuming the Telos reputational database, which tracks the uh, trustworthiness of internet actors. DNA Center, Trust Analytics specifically, is coordinating port and credential scans of endpoints and is consuming the results of those port and credential scans. Again, those two presentations I linked at the start um, unpack this more. There's quite a bit under the hood here. I'm just trying to put it together in a clean story, and then if you're interested, you can go and do the necessary research. The endpoint analytics labels, what we think devices are, are pushed into ICE, and the derived trust scores based on device behavior are pushed into ICE, and we can then reference that in policy to dial up and dial down endpoint access. All right, so as I said, um, if you have DNA Center, Endpoint Analytics is just a different application inside the same, uh, the same host here. So we jump into Endpoint Analytics, 
And if we have a look at our endpoint inventory here, uh, you will see loads of VMware and Ubuntu and Debian. As I said, most of the devices in the lab are virtual machines, so they don't really mean anything useful in this discussion. But the bottom three devices here do mean something. These are real devices that I've plugged in. I have not fed any information into endpoint analytics here. It has looked at how these devices transact and it is making an assertion as to what they are. So we can see here, it says streamer, phone and camera. It's suggested an operating system, a vendor and a hardware manufacturer for these particular devices. So why does this matter? Well, for anyone that's maintained Mac auth databases where the only thing you know is a Mac address, Endpoint Analytics represents a significant departure from having to manage Mac addresses. It will make an assertion as to what a thing is based on how that thing behaves over time. And if something's misclassified, it will obviously reclassify it as whatever it is. Now we can see here in the policy that um, I've said, if a thing is being MAB authenticated, so the two center rules, so um, I might be going a bit off book here, maybe the, the subject matter expert will correct me later, but if a device is managed and it has a supplicant and an MDM and a posture agent, whatever, you've got outstanding visibility of that already, and you probably authenticate that through 802.1x. But for things you can't control, where they have no supplicant, you have to use MAB, you have no choice. If you're using MAB, then what we can do inside of a MAB policy is instead of referencing a MAC address, we reference those labels that come out of endpoint analytics. So we're saying here, if a device is profiled as a streamer and it has a trust score of greater than five, it can go into a particular network with a particular SGT. Same for the next line down. Streamer is our TV and camera is our Meraki camera here. So um, I'm not maintaining the MAC addresses of these devices. Endpoint Analytics derives what they are and it updates that over time. Um, so it's a substantially less manual way of doing MAB. The top one here will be leveraging in a second. This here is saying if a trust score of a BMS device drops below three, it is still allowed onto the network, but it's going to receive a different SGT. This SGT will heavily restrict how much access this device has into the network. So this is an example of an automatic quarantine. You don't have to do it this way, but it's here as an option um, if you feel it's useful. Okay. So just hopping here into the uh, IP SGT table inside of ICE, and we can see here that this endpoint 103311 is currently a BMS, receiving the BMS SGT. So its trust score is above three. Uh, this will be important in a moment. The other thing I've done off screen to save you the hassle of watching me do it is um, I have I've implemented some SGT, quarantine SGT, to, uh, to URL policies. So at the start we said quarantine should be able to talk to cisco.com, quarantine should be able to talk to 48. Quarantine does not talk to anything else. So in this organization, quarantine is very heavily restricted. Um, and what we're about to see is that the beauty of using SGTs to represent what things are is we can adjust policy on a per endpoint basis by changing the SGT assigned to an endpoint. All right. The other thing I've done is put in I've modified the group-based access control uh, matrix here to say quarantine should not be able to speak to anything and nothing should be able to speak to quarantine other than the hosts that are permitted through the firewall. Um, so again, it's very heavily locked down. Inside of AI endpoint analytics, as I said before, trust analytics is a subcomponent of this. Um, we have a range of sources that are used to derive a trust score for an endpoint. In this demonstration, we focus on Telos IP reputation, what hosts is the endpoint communicating with and are they reputable? And we'll be focusing on port scan and credential scan. So are there vulnerable ports or vulnerable credentials on our endpoints? Okay. So back to endpoint analytics, if we take a trust score view here of the devices that are in scope for the demo. There is a trust score of six or five, 
assigned to each of these devices, what we'll see is as they do things that we consider to be inappropriate, that trust score will be dialed down. Okay, so uh, this BMS device here, 103311, as we saw before, it currently has a BMS SGT, and it has connectivity to the AWS server, which is alive, and it has connectivity to other BMS devices. We'll send some packets to a known bad internet actor. As a consequence, that Telos IP reputational uh, check will fire here. We'll see that the trust score of this particular device, 103311, has dropped to three, and there is a Telos IP reputational infraction there. I'll just skip through this. This is just listing the detail of what went wrong. Um, the bottom line is the trust score has dropped to three. If we refresh the screen here, we'll see that the SGT has been reassigned to quarantine. So the ICE policy we saw before re-executes if a trust score changes or if an endpoint analytics label changes. So this is essentially an automatic quarantine. Okay, I will rerun the script again. And this here has lost access to AWS because it now has a quarantine SGT. It is blocked from communicating with servers until it's remediated. Uh, four rates was permitted through the firewall, so that's still happening. Here, it can talk to other BMS devices. It should not be able to, but I have all four BMS devices on a vSwitch in the lab, and there is no segmentation in a vSwitch. So if I had cabled each device, to a different switch port, they would be segmented. Um, so um, hopefully I've established that segmentation works and um, these should be unreachable if these things were cabled properly. Um, so we can say that this device has been cut off from the network more or less, except for 4.8, and we saw in the firewall policy it's permitted to access Cisco.com. Um, we access another URL, it's not permitted to access that. Um, so Device did something bad, quarantine SGT is assigned, access is cut down. I didn't have to do anything by hand to make that happen. I build the policy, trust score changes, device is cut off from the network. This other device here, uh, 103313, uh, it, I've put different vulnerabilities on here. I've just opened up some illegal ports and put some illegal credentials on it. So we can see here that Trust Analytics is seeing credential vulnerability and unauthorized port on 10.3.3.13. It's dropped the score to four. Um, so we remember in the policy before, it was three and below that's auto-quarantined. Four doesn't quite meet the criteria. So if you don't want to use automatic quarantine, uh, then you can instead just click on the device and choose to quarantine it manually through the UI here. Exactly the same thing happens. I'll skip the rest of this. The SGT has changed from BMS to quarantine. It's cut off from the network, and um, some manual remediation needs to happen in order to restore its access. Still with me? Not long to go. OK. Right, the last one is Cisco Secure Endpoint and Rapid Threat Containment. So that was a demonstration of devices we can't look inside of. They're IoT things, cameras, BMS things. So we have to make assertions based on their behavior. In the case of Cisco Secure Endpoint, we have an agent on the endpoint that reports what is actually happening on the endpoint. Um, Cisco Secure Endpoint does loads of stuff more than I could possibly understand, but the high level pitch is it is an agent that runs on managed endpoints that looks for suspicious or malicious things and reports those back to a controller. We will use Cisco Secure Endpoint to detect a, an issue on a managed endpoint. It will report that issue into our networking infrastructure. The infrastructure will automatically quarantine the endpoint for behaving badly. How does this work? Endpoints run Cisco Secure Endpoint, an application. Um, obviously, again, this only applies to managed endpoints. Cisco Secure Endpoint reports events back to a cloud controller. Those events can be synced to various places, to Firepower manage Firewall Management Center or ISE. In this case, uh, I'm sending the information to ISE, but I'm not doing anything with it in ISE. I've chosen to act through the Firewall Management Center um, through a correlation pol policy that will fire a quarantine. When we fire a quarantine, in our ICE policy, we change the SGT from employee, in this case, to quarantine. So, the employee uh, 
I imagine you, you, you know what's going to happen, but let's just click through it quickly. All right. Okay, so here what we're saying is this employee device will be receiving the quarantine SGT if it has a quarantine flag associated with it, otherwise known as an ANC policy. All right. Sorry, I've skipped too far ahead in the video there, I beg your pardon. Um, this is a side note, just some uh, flagrant advertising. ISC can consume visibility information from a range of places. It's not just Cisco stuff. You can see there Qualys, Rapid7, Tenable, etc. So we can reference other security vendors' metrics to make policy decisions in ICE. Uh, I've shown endpoint analytics, but that's not the only way of attacking it. Okay, so. We've been through this policy already, so we'll just power on. Uh, inside of the firewall management center, there is a correlation policy defined. What we're saying here is if, um, this is called, the language here says AMP. AMP was the previous name of Cisco Secure Endpoint. So uh, the language has been updated in some places and not others, please forgive that. Um, but if you see AMP, think Cisco Secure Endpoint. Um, we have a rule here that's saying if, if there is a malware detection on the endpoint, then we will fire the AMP threat rule. The, the AMP threat rule, as we see in a moment, matches this policy called ANC quarantine. And ANC quarantine, in turn, will quarantine the source of the infraction. Okay, so there is, looking in Firewall Management Center, there is currently no correlations. There has been no indicator of compromise connected. Connect. There has been no IOC detected by Cisco Secure Endpoint, but we're about to change that. On this staff endpoint, this is connected over fabric-enabled wireless, by the way, just to prove a point that SGTs mean the same thing in both domains, wired and wireless. On the staff endpoint, we have a look at AMP CLI, I presume this will be renamed later to Cisco Secure Endpoint CLI. It looks like the renaming is underway. But we have this management agent running. It's connected to the cloud. And um, I'll just skip through the history, but this is just saying that it's booted and it's downloaded some, um, some virus definitions. It scans some disks and so on. Now, this employee endpoint has access to everything except for the previously quarantined devices in the last section. Uh, we go to a, to, a, to a website, download a fragment of a virus, EI car. It's saved to disk on the employee wireless device. After a moment, that file disappears. So that is Cisco Secure Endpoint identifying the file as containing a known malicious content and quarantining it on the disk of the device. What Cisco Secure Endpoint has also done is reported this event back to the cloud controller, which in turn has reported it into the network. Ultimately, what happens here, of course, is this endpoint, and um, if you look at the video, this is one minute apart from, from when I ran the checker previously. Um, this endpoint is now severed from the network. So it has access to malicious file, that event's been reported to the network infrastructure, the endpoint has been quarantined on the network, meaning it has quarantined SGT. So it still has some connectivity, but it is heavily restricted. Now I'm showing here a heavy restriction because that's my choice, but quarantine means whatever you say it means inside of ICE policy. All right, and we're almost there. We're gonna be right on the 90 minutes. So to wrap it up, <coughs> We've shown a great deal of uh, functionality here. Shown end-to-end -end segmentation using virtual networks and SGTs, using data center objects like EPGs and AWS attributes. We've used endpoint analytics and trust analytics to determine what a thing is, assign it a level of access, and then reduce that access if they behave badly. We've also used uh, Cisco Secure Endpoint to detect issues on managed endpoints that report that into the network infrastructure and quarantine devices for behaving badly. Um, I hope it's apparent that SD access, which has been the center of this conversation, but not the whole conversation, is a foundation for delivering a dynamic zero trust architecture in the workplace and across the whole enterprise.
please talk to your sales folks, CX and partners if you want to explore other ideas. This is just some of the ideas. There's far more uh, ways of skinning this cat. And with that, um, I mentioned before, I spend most of my time in SD Access. Uh, we spend a lot of time developing SD Access based on customer feedback. There's a make a wish button in the UI. Please submit your use cases. If it can't do something, talk to your sales folks. The queue is huge for things we need to work on, but the more feedback we get, the better we can focus our energy on the right things. So that is it. Thank you very much for your time. Um, the session surveys are useful. Should I do this again? Should I do something differently? Let us know. My bosses don't attend these presentations, so scores are the only proxy they have. If you think the presentation's been useful, a, a high score is good. Thank you.